Peru, summer of 1970. Peru has painfully learned to live with earthquakes, avalanches, tidal waves, jaguars, and poisonous snakes. But Dennis Hopper was something else. At 34, he is known in Hollywood as a sullen renegade who talks revolution, settles arguments with karate, goes to bed with groups, and has taken trips on everything you can swallow or shoot. On the other hand, in the salons and the galleries of Los Angeles and New York, he is recognized as a talented poet, painter, sculptor, photographer, and as a leading collector of pop art. He is also, after eight years on the movie industry's blacklists, the hottest director in Hollywood. Easy Rider, which cost only $370,000, is rapidly approaching a projected $15 million gross. In the process, it has polarized a new film audience of under 30s, generated a new school of talented young directors, such as Jack Nicholson, Peter Bogdanovich, and Melvin Van Peebles, and established the style of a new Hollywood in which producers wear love beads instead of diamond stick pins and blow grass when they used to chew coronas. Yet to Dennis Hopper, Easy Rider was just a childish toddle in the direction he intends his movies to take. My next picture, he has promised his friends, is really going to be heavy, man. Then he hired a cast that included some of the most conspicuous individualists in Hollywood, among them Peter Fonda, Dean Stockwell, Jim Mitchum, Russ Tamblin, John Philip Law, and Michelle Phillips of the Mamas and Papas. He hired Dennis Hopper as the movie's leading man, and he invited everybody to a location 14,000 feet above sea level in the backlands of Peru, a country where all major drugs, cocaine, speed, heroin, hallucinogens, are restricted but can in fact be purchased over the counter without a prescription. Get all those cats together down there, said one Hollywood reporter, and you'll have the wildest scene in the history of the movies. When I joined Dennis Hopper on location in Peru, I didn't recognize him. Since Easy Rider, he had dropped about 30 pounds of blubber and 10 pounds of hair. On the way to the set, Dennis talked. Man, the movies are coming out of a dark age. I mean, for 40 years, the uncreative people told the creative people what to do. But now we're telling them, like, forget those big budgets. The only thing you can make with a big budget is a big, impersonal, dishonest movie. We want to make little, personal, honest movies. So we're taking small salaries and gambling on the gross. And we're going to make groovy movies, man. My second day in Cusco, Dennis gave me a curt, clear, precise of the movie he was about to make. It's called The Last Movie, and it's a story about America and how it's destroying itself. The hero is a stuntman in a lousy western. When his movie unit goes back to the States, he stays on in Peru to develop a location for other westerns. He's Mr. Middle America. He dreams of big cars, swimming pools, gorgeous girls. He's so innocent, he doesn't realize he's living out a myth, nailing himself to a cross of gold. But the Indians realize it. They see the lousy Western as a tragic legend of greed and violence in which everybody dies in the end. So they build a camera out of junk and reenact the movie as a religious rite. To play the victim in the ceremony, they pick the stuntman. The end is far out. By mid-afternoon, the game became more serious. Somebody made a cocaine connection and a number of actors laid in a large supply at bargain prices. There was a mountain of coke down there. As Dennis said, we might have been drug addicts, but we were drug addicts with a point of view and a work ethic. Dennis thinks of Easy Rider as a rehearsal of the last movie, the first picture conceived and created from start to finish by Dennis Hopper. This is the big one, he told me. If I fool up now, they'll say Easy Rider was a fluke, but I've got to take chances to do what I want. 
The day before shooting started, I realized he was prepared to take astonishing chances. When I asked how closely he expected to follow the script, he replied, I'm not afraid to start to work with an empty head. If you can't create out of the moment, you're not creating. Did he really intend to improvise a full-length feature film? All through the first day of shooting, he seemed to be improvising disaster. On the second day of shooting, there was no doubt about it. Every scene, every line of the horse opera sequence that introduces the last movie was improvised. In a matter of minutes, Dennis hooked up a story, a ballistic burlesque of a John Wayne Western that somehow managed to involve Billy the Kid, D.H. Lawrence, and James Dean. By noon, he had put about 15 minutes of film in the can, and most of it, as somebody said, was out of sight. The second week of shooting, Dennis filmed a party scene, and I saw that energy flow. The setting for the episode was a desperately vulgar California tract house transplanted to the Andes. He did for the landscape what wax lips do for a face. All the time you could see John Philip Law shooting on Super 8. As Dennis's power increases, it will be interesting to see how the movie industry copes with the man. Not long after I left Peru, he grabbed the local character who was bothering him and rammed his head through a glass coffee table. About the same time, Dennis spoke to a group of radical students who a few days before had exploded some Molotov cocktails in Cusco's principal plaza and made a statement the Junta considered inflammatory. A special government emissary was sent to tell Dennis he could either shut up or get out. He shut up, completed his picture, flew back to LA, announced his engagement to Michelle Phillips, and then casually added he needed a full year to edit and assemble the last movie. Brad Darak, journalist.